This is Agriculture Adapts by Climate AI. We are a team of climate scientists and agriculture entrepreneurs on a mission to make agriculture more resilient, sustainable, and profitable in the face of a changing climate. This podcast is our journey as we speak with industry-leading executives, farmers, and thought leaders to uncover the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for the industry that feeds the world. I'm your host, Borna Porshikani. Welcome to Agriculture Adapts. Hey everyone, really insightful episode coming up here and I want to just make sure I lay out the right foundation for you. So I'm going to provide a bit of background here to help capture the significance of this episode because this recording truly is a special opportunity. Over the last decade, there has been an increase in interest amongst institutional investors to invest in food and agriculture, largely because of its relatively high average returns, low variability, and low correlation with financial markets, which is all just a fancy way of saying that it does pretty well when everything else doesn't. After the 2008 financial crisis, when the world economy was in disarray, agriculture seemed to be doing fairly well. At the same time, the 2007-2008 world food crisis left governments looking for better ways to secure their food supplies. This marked the trigger point when institutional investors started accelerating their footprint in agriculture investments. Agriculture has since become a key pillar in the investment portfolio of some of the largest investors, managing the biggest pools of money around the world. Today, we sit down with Martin Davies, president and CEO of the number one largest manager of farmland assets in the world, to better understand how institutional investing in ag works, how it intersects with climate change and agricultural resilience, what sustainable ag means to them, and what all this means for the future of agriculture. Martin runs the Westchester Group, focusing on farmland investments for the parent company, TIAA. TIAA manages over $1 trillion in assets with holdings in more than 50 countries. Westchester is the farmland-focused subsidiary that covers over 2 million acres across seven countries. Martin, very excited for this episode. Thank you for joining us here today. Thanks, Warner. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Really looking forward to the conversation. Pleasure to, to join you. So I just gave the over-formalized high-level intro, but uh, could you start by telling us a bit about your background and your journey into the world of agriculture? I grew up on a farm uh, and have been working in the agricultural sector for 28 years, studied agriculture and farm management uh, and business, agribusiness at university, worked in corporate agriculture in the UK for 13 years, ran a pretty substantial business, 85,000 acres farming various commodities in the UK. Um, left that business in the early 2000s and started working on investment projects for private investors in Eastern Europe, so countries, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, also did some work in Ukraine and Russia. And that was really a, it was a natural transition for me to move from corporate agriculture. I was very familiar with scale and some of the disciplines, governance disciplines, which is so important from an investment point of view. So it was a natural transition to make. Whilst I was working in Eastern Europe, I was approached by a London-based asset management business to set up a farmland strategy, and, and that was to raise capital from really pension fund investors who um, had really been attracted to the asset class. Um, I did that for about five years, and I've been working for Westchester now for six years. I started out setting the business up. Um, in Europe, and I took over running the, the overall business three years ago. Uh, so, yeah, I spend a lot of time looking at agriculture and what's going on globally um, across all the different locations where, where we invest. Awesome. And when you talk about your, your background in corporate agriculture, were you kind of like an agronomist? Were you in charge of setting up strategy there? What, what was that role like? Yeah, it was, it was an operational role, so running the business I do have qualifications in agronomy, uh, but really business management, yeah, multi-commodity business, so in dairying, in crop production, vegetable production, top fruit and, and soft fruit. So very good grounding and very good understanding that that gave me across different aspects of the agricultural sector. Um, it was part of a wider business as well. Uh, and there was some vertical integration, so it gave me some pretty good insights into upstream activities, processing, um, packing of produce, and, and then on to the onto category management of the supermarket. Yeah, and I think that definitely says a lot to have someone who has the operational background as the head of the team there. And just so I can lay down the foundation properly before we dive in, in a general sense, who invests in farmlands and why? And 
Can you explain this as if you're explaining this to someone with no finance background? Like what draws investors towards agriculture as opposed to another type of investment? Any investment in the agricultural sector really is underpinned by what's happening globally, population-wise. So the FAO talk about 9.7 billion people by 2050. And on top of that, you've got increased calorific consumption in developing countries. So um, over the next 50 years, food production needs to double. So really very attractive fundamentals to, to the sector. But if you look at farmland returns, agricultural returns historically, um, because you're producing the necessities of life and through the, the pandemic, we've seen lots of um, industries very significantly disrupted um, by the pandemic. But through any type of economic event or any anything that happens globally, people still need to eat so that the demand for agricultural products remains very strong. So that inelasticity in demand that agricultural products have means that there's very low volatility in returns um, in the sector. So that really is attractive from an investment point of view. Um, historically, we've seen capital growth in farmland values as well as productivity has improved. So the, the things that really have attracted investors through time, the concept of institutional investors in agriculture is by no means new. Um, pension funds were investing in agriculture in the UK, if you go back to the uh, mid 80s and into the 90s. Um, low volatility of returns and solid income returns plus capital appreciation. But one of the other things which has been a, a very attractive aspect is farmland has very close correlation with inflation. So if you're a pension fund and you've got floating liabilities, something which gives you a very good inflation hedge adds a lot of value from a diversification point of view uh, for, a, for a portfolio. That makes sense. What is Westchester's business model and approach to investing? What is Westchester exactly doing? How are they making money? And how do you interact with farms and farmers? Yeah, so let's, let's take a step back there. So if you look at agriculture, generally, it's an industry where there's a lot of inherent risk. So there's commodity price volatility, there's weather risk, um, climate change risk to consider now, of course, there's government intervention and regulation. So to d deliver consistent returns to investors over time, you have to diversify uh, in what you invest in in the sector. So we would advocate diversifying by the country, the location within the country, and by the crop type, and also by the way that you operate the assets. Now, um, if you think about um, simple cropping, so row crops, so exchange-traded commodity crops, our approach there would be more of a passive strategy because it's more difficult to add value when you're growing those crops, so we lease out the land, Whereas in the case of permanent crops, where there are far more opportunities to add value, so if you think about wine grapes, we produce in California about 100,000 tons of wine grapes on an annual basis. Uh, we're selling to over 100 wineries. Some of those are very discerning. So very much more opportunity to add value than there is in wine grapes than there is growing soybeans in, in, in the Midwest. Okay, so what are we, where are we looking to generate income? So... Income return comes from the, the rental payments in the case of leasing out and where we're operating the assets. The income return comes from the physical sale of the, the, the crop. We're looking for capital appreciation also in, in, in the farmland that we're buying. We would tend to see in row crops a lower income return, but we'd expect to see a higher capital appreciation. Whereas where we're taking risk on permanent crops, we expect to see a much greater um, income return, so greater return for the additional risk we're taking on. But we wouldn't expect to see as much value appreciation because in the case of any permanent crop, you've got the biological asset to think about. So if you've got vines or almond trees or citrus trees, those have a set lifespan. So you need to depreciate that biological asset over time. So although you have underlying land which is increasing in value the biological asset is depreciating so you put those two together you do see some appreciation but not to the extent that you see um, in in, um, in row crop so income return coming from lease payments and sale of crop value appreciation adding to that total return component
So, Paul, you asked about how does the relationship with, with, with farmers work. So, in the case of row crops, we are predominantly, and this applies to the majority of locations where we, we own and manage land on behalf of our investors, we're leasing out to local farmers, and invariably those local farmers are private, family-operated um, type businesses. Um, in the case of permanent crops, we're operating those assets we're outsourcing the, the vineyard or the orchard operations to a professional contractor who provides those services. So the farmer tenant base that we have is very important uh, to what we do. And, and I think of our investors as a, a client, but I also think of our um, farmers who we're leasing land to as a client as well. And we're performing an important function in the sector, certainly in the row crop sector, we are an additional source of capital um, coming into the sector. So there's significant transfer of wealth between generations or generational transfers, meaning that you've got land coming to the market. Institutional capital is, a, is coming into the sector and is replacing ownership in, in that way. It's, it's pretty important for the, the, the sector generally. What are the key crops that you guys focus on? Like, Where does the focus really lie for you? Is it just identifying where the specialties are in each region that you're focused on? Or is it, you know, we're focused on X, Y, and Z crop because we know how to do those well and we're going to find the right places to do those? We're looking for good diversification generally, but within that diversification, we're looking at for crops which don't, they're not, the returns are not correlated or the pricing is not correlated. So if you, if you think about the cereal grain complex, prices of corn, wheat, sorghum generally tend to track with each other and the same could be said of the oilseed complex so soybean um, canola sunflower tend to move together but when you start talking about some of the horticultural crops the way that they behave they're not correlated so wine grapes don't behave in the same way as as, as corn or soybeans equally avocados don't behave in the same way so what we're looking to do is to achieve diversification across a portfolio, a mixture of crops which the returns are not correlated. But scale is important. Um, and are these crops investable? So people talk about investing in hops because there's been a significant increase in demand for hops with, with craft brewing. But to us, it's just not a sector that is easily investable at scale. So today, across our portfolio, 43 different crop types are growing. So avocados to almonds, wheat to walnuts, um, a, a good mixture of, of cropping. Um, and that is really important in delivering consistent returns. But not only, it's, it's to offset the risks that exist from a, a government intervention and, a, and regulatory point of view. And, and this is a great example here. So everybody's aware of the, the, the trade dispute between the US and, and China, which I think overall we are reasonably well beyond now. But during the the, the pandemic, there's been a little bit of a trade dispute between um, Australia and China. China imposed an 80% tariff on barley exports from Australia to, to China. So um, if you were only invested in barley in Australia, things wouldn't look so great. Whereas if you look at Brazil, Brazil in 2020 to date is, is recording record soybean exports um, and the majority of those soybeans are going to China. So this concept of investing in different locations in different crops really does offset risks that are inherent in the sector. But how do we think about this at a, at a base level? If you think about the, the globe, there's four main grain and oilseed producing regions, so North America, um, South America, Europe, and Australia, New Zealand. We're looking to invest in those locations as a foundation of a portfolio investing in row crops in in those locations and then we look to invest in permanent crops where there's a, a comparative advantage for production of the, the crop we like the concept of investing in the northern and the southern hemisphere because there are windows of supply into the market where you have for example avocados coming out of chile going into europe when the northern hemisphere does not have supply so you can capitalize on that year-round demand through investing in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So that's, that's the basic approach that we, we have. 
Uh, we do a lot of analysis around what the, the trends are. So one of the things is the, the link between health and nutrition. So superfoods will continue uh, their growth and demand. So can we align what we're doing around um, some of the trends in the sector? Um, and if you think about some of the locations we're looking as new opportunities today, Spain and Portugal are countries that we're looking at from an investment point of view. We're interested in olives, we're interested in almonds, we're interested in walnuts, avocado, citrus and table grapes, all crops which have seen, uh, they've got a health halo around them and, and they are seeing significant growth in demand. Yeah, and so I want to go back to one quick thing. So obviously, it sounds like you guys are invested in a pretty large array, I think you mentioned 40 uh, of different crops, but you said that hops was not really investable. Can you help us understand what makes something investable versus not? One of the reasons why is a lot of hop production is on a relatively small scale. Uh, there are areas globally where hop production is concentrated. Um, so if you're an institutional investor, you have to be able to invest at scale. So although there's, there's been significant growth in demand um, and the market is very looking pretty good, it's not, it's not something that right now we consider to be the investable institutionally. And, and there are always going to be limitations on what, what you can do. Um, but even with those limitations, there's the ability to achieve good diversification across different crop types. I want to go into the climate piece of this now. A changing climate adds a lot of uncertainty, variability, and risk to agriculture operations around the world. Have some crops or regions felt like they have been more vulnerable or susceptible than others with this increasing weather variability or increased risk of extremes or shifting seasons? There is no location globally where there, there are not subtle changes in climate. So whether it be changes in the seasonality of rainfall or higher temperatures or lower temperatures or volatility um, in temperatures pretty much every location you care to think there there is there is some impact in climate change but i think we should we should always look at this in the context of what's happened historically there have been floods there have been droughts through time and, and agriculture has been impacted by that which goes back to the point i made make about diversifying where, where you invest. But there's no doubt that the volatility of climate is increasing. And if you look at the current situation, literally right now, France is, is recording a, a heat wave, record temperatures in France. We've got wildfires in California, which are caused by freakish storms. Um, literally in the last month, we've had a, a massive storm go through the the Midwest. So significant swathes of corn and soybeans in Iowa damaged terminally by um, that storm and last week we had Hurricane Laura which when it made landfall um, 150 mile an hour wind so there undoubtedly is, is change if you look at the seasons I'm, I'm in the UK at the moment um, and in Cambridgeshire which is what 60 miles north of London give or take the cereal harvest was finished at the start of August and, and things seem to get earlier every year so there is undoubtedly change going on. But I, I think what, what we think about when we're making our investments is land quality is everything. And when I mean land quality, I mean the quality of soil that you're investing in, the reliability of rainfall. Um, and if you've got irrigated crops, the reliability of water. So having both surface and groundwater, if you have fundamentally good quality land, which drains well, it has good soil type, the volatility in climate, that type of land deals with it far, far better. And when you overlay on top of that some of the seed technology, you've got hybrid seeds and seeds which can deal with that greater volatility. There's a fair degree that you can go to offset some of the challenges, but undoubtedly there is there is change that's taking place. But it really does reinforce this approach of diversifying what you invest in and, and, and where you invest as well. Yeah. And so when you go in on a new parcel of land, what are the different considerations that you're trying to make? Like you mentioned that the soil needs to be good, needs to have access to water. How much of a role is climate playing in that decision? Like, are you trying to look out to see what the climate will be in that region over the next 10, 20 years for some of these permanent crops? Um, or are you really just focusing on 
that soil quality component and these other things that you mentioned are kind of like the anchors of the investment? No, so let me explain the way that, that our business works, Borna. So agriculture is a local business. So one of the things which I, I believe differentiates our platform and, and really has underpinned the success that we've had over the last 15 or 20 years is that we every location that we invest in, we have people locally on the ground where we're investing. Those are people that know the geography, they know the region, they know the local farmers, they know the differences in microclimate, they know the differences in soil type. So that knowledge and expertise is, is critical in what we do. However, data and information, whether that be about climate, um, whether that be about performance of, of, of crops, whether that be about frost incidence over time, that's increasingly important and as part of the underwriting process we're trying to look at that information how climate is changing over time and what the long-term trajectory is um, for the locations to factor into the underwriting but um, local knowledge and expertise is critical in in the agricultural sector is agriculture becoming a less stable source of returns now because of a lot of these changes that we're seeing i think there is when you look at a, at a, at a production level, there, there is more volatility um, in production and, and ultimately that's coming from different, different weather cycles. Now, I think the technology that, that exists, whether it be, we've been talking about seed technology and genetics or whether it's technology around seeding, machinery, uh, remote sensors, I think a lot of that goes to offset some of the, the challenges around volatility. But... Uh, I think resilience in the agricultural sector is, is, is really important going into the future. But even within an individual business, diversification is a good thing. And if you look back through time, that without the aid of technology and, and, and many things that we take for granted today, the fundamental approach that uh, farmers had was to try and diversify their activities to offset the risks that are inherent in, in, in the sector. So. We really do need to capitalize on what technology can offer us. Um, and I think better business management disciplines, understanding the risk um, that exists within, with, within businesses, not just from climatic influence, but many of the other things that impact agriculture as well are, are required in, in today's environment. Yeah, and I guess just on the topic of volatility, how has COVID impacted your returns or your operations? Have you started to get data back on that or have you? So uh, I think if we ultimately we, we need to look at consumer trends through, through the pandemic. And I would say generally what we've seen across all groceries, we've seen very stable demand, if anything, and there's been an increase in demand. Um, so across all groceries, whether you're looking at beverages or whether you're looking at basic grains and and pulses and so on. Now, there are certain crops where there has been some downturn in consumption. So I think cotton would be a good example. So of course, um, China is a fairly major player in um, cotton spinning and, and um, the textiles industry. So very early impact there from the pandemic. So 2020 uh, total cotton spinning is, is forecast to be down 7%. But mm. if you look at the basic food, there's been some movement in consumer trends within grocery sectors. So one of the things that's been seen is a significant increase in organic consumption um, in most locations, the UK, US, France, organic consumption is up 25%. Oh, wow. Um, and that's really... Since March or since like the start of... Since the start of the pandemic. And, and that's, I guess, driven by a number of things. One being that quite a bit of organic produce comes through box schemes. So if you think about delivery of groceries, that naturally fits in there. But one of the things which the pandemic has brought is a closer connection between food and nutrition, mm. people being more focused on eating healthily so uh, there's definitely a trend there but there's definitely a trend on sustainable food production but overall if you look at the total consumption in the sector it's pretty stable and really that translates its way through it's it's too early to say for 2020 really from you know if you look at the northern hemisphere where we're through some of the cereal harvest but we're coming into corn harvest now soybeans will be later but 
generally speaking, there, there doesn't appear to be any impact. Um, and, and we're coming into harvest of nuts in California now and, and wine, grape, wine grapes. Doesn't seem to be any significant drop in demand for what's being produced on farmland. So the, the, the theory suggests that returns will hold up very well. If you think about that very strong demand and the fundamental case for farmland and the demand for what's being produced, it's pretty understandable why there's been a very limited impact um, in the sector. Yeah, when when this whole thing started, I was really curious to see like what crops would be impacted in which ways. And, and I, I don't know the information, maybe you do, but I was particularly curious to see how biofuels would be impacted and thus like what the impact on a lot of maize production would be. But I mean, now we're seeing people traveling all over the place with their cars going to go into Airbnbs and remote land. So maybe maybe the uh, the consumption is not as far down as I initially thought it would be. Yeah, of, of course, if you look at if you look at the agricultural commodities that have got a closer link to, to oil, so sugarcane and corn, so corn ethanol in the US is still pretty important as an oxygenate in gasoline in Brazil sugarcane being produced into, into, into ethanol is really important. So if you look across the full spectrum of agricultural commodities, corn and sugarcane probably have been impacted a little bit more than some of the other commodities. But if you look at wheat, you look at other oil seeds, they, they don't have quite the same connectivity with that oil complex. Not, not They've recovered fairly well from an initial downturn back in, in, in March. Gotcha. I want to shift gears here. I want to talk about what Westchester is doing on the sustainable agriculture front. And I think this question is extremely important, primarily because Westchester is the number one largest farmland asset manager in the world. And the decisions you make bear a lot of influence on others. So I know you are operating globally and across a number of crops, but give us a sense of how your team thinks about sustainable agriculture principles. Yeah, so sustainability is embedded in everything we do in our investment process, in our thinking about what we do in the management of the assets. So we are custodians of farmland and we have a new, we have an obligation to leave that farmland in, 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 a, in a better condition than when we when we took ownership of it. So sustainability in ESG is key to us. Um, if you think about us as an organization, we're owned by TIAA. TIAA is managing retirement benefits for 5 million people working in the education sector in, in the US. So people who are very thoughtful about environment, social um, considerations, um, they're thinking about climate change. So we've always had a very forward thinking approach to this and, and really a desire to set the standards. So we were one of the original signing uh, signatories to the principles of responsible investment in farmland. Uh, we reported against those principles. We have been involved in the Sustainable Ag Working Group in the US um, who have developed the leading harvest certification standard. We have historically, wherever possible, had certification standards in place. So those could be Global Gap, there could be Better Cotton Initiative, there could be Bon Securo, the sugar certification standard in, in Brazil amongst various other certification standards. We see the opportunity to, in our investments and particularly capital investment in the properties that we're acquiring, to make investment which improves the environmental factors, so whether that be water use, whether it be investing in technology. We see very good alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and this is a great example, one of the properties in one of our structures, um, a vineyard in, in Monterey in California, um, a vineyard where we bought existing vines but also had the opportunity to, new, to develop some new vineyards. Um, but one of the things that we were able to do within that investment, which was to, was to dramatically improve the efficiency of water use mm. by lining irrigation reservoirs and irrigation canals, and investing in more sophisticated water to deliver to, to the vine. So by default, very good alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as, a, as an investor, as an institutional investor, you have the inclination to put capital to work in properties which wouldn't necessarily be 
um, the same uh, under maybe private ownership. Um, so uh, sustainability is, is very important for us. And I think one of the things which is a, is a great focus for us right now is just working out how we monetize natural capital value. Um, agriculture has, has received a lot of neg negative publicity about climate change. So the IPCC report said that agriculture was responsible for 26% of greenhouse gas emissions, partly from land use change, partly from the ag agricultural activity. But if we think about the ability to set, sequester carbon in soil, agriculture can be a big part of the solution to climate change. And by yeah. subtly evolving the way that you operate and manage properties, growing cover crops, no tillage approach, growing companion crops, there are many ways that agriculture can be an important part of, of the solution to climate change now Capital markets need to drive change and, and there needs to be a market that develops for the carbon that farmers can se sequester on the land, tradable uh, carbon offsets, or whatever it is. So that is an increasing focus from a business point of view. Um, that all fundamentally starts off with having a framework to be able to monitor and measure um, sustainability metrics, so soil organic matter, water quality, um, to name two of many metrics that we are uh, looking to measure over time. You guys are tracking carbon now too, right? I think I read somewhere that you guys are tracking carbon as well. We're trying to look at the carbon footprint of the, the, the assets. Um, we acknowledge the fact that it's quite early days and we're just trying to develop better systems to, to analyze and, and to, to look at what we do. So just as an example, one of the things which we haven't really um, gotten to grips with fully just yet is if we have, for example, an almond orchard, so the trees in the almond orchard, what is the impact where they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? We have to think about the offset that exists there because at the end of their lifespan, almond tree lasts 15, 20 years. Uh, what do you do with the, the trees? Is there a biomass market? Uh, what's the energy consumed there? But those are, those are important things. If we look at portfolio that we have in, in Brazil, assets in Brazil, there's a requirement across the different regions of Brazil to have what's called conservation reserves, so native vegetation as a certain percentage of the total cropped area. Uh, we know that our uh, conservation reserve on the properties that we manage in Brazil contains 32 million tons of carbon in the trees and the shrubs and, and, and the native vegetation which is on that conservation reserve area. So Agriculture is a big part of the solution to climate change, not part of the problem. Um, and, and that's something that increasingly is a focus for us um, uh, from a business point of view is, is getting to grips with that and how we can monetize some of that value for our investors, but also how we can make agriculture an industry which is, which is part of the solution. Yeah, and it's also one of the only actually necessary things that we <laughs> that we need. So it's it's kind of weird when we pose it as as only a negative. But you guys are doing a ton with with a lot of transparency. You have the map that shows where all your operations are around the world, and kind of some details on that stuff. And your your sustainability report, I think, was was pretty extensive and pretty impressive to look at as well. You mentioned land use change, and I wanted to talk about some of the work that you guys were doing in Brazil. So in the sustainability report some work on Brazilian deforestation is mentioned. Can you speak a little bit to, to what's happening on that front? Yeah, so in 2018, we implemented a, a zero deforestation policy uh, in Brazil. So we do not want to acquire any assets in Brazil which cannot uh, pass that deforestation test, which is independently uh, validated. So in Brazil... There's been a huge amount of focus on deforestation in the Sahado and also in the Amazon. Um, our deforestation policy does apply to the other biomes as well, so the Atlantic Forest and the Pantanal. Um, but the majority of investments we do have are in the Sahado and the, the Atlantic Forest. To our knowledge, no other asset manager has a, a zero deforestation policy in, in Brazil. So we're really trying to set a standard and trying to improve one of the things that institutions who invest in farmland frequently get criticised about is what they're doing. Um, they're displacing family farmers. Um, they're, they're, they're doing things which 
are perceived not to be good for the for the sector. Yeah. But institutional investment does bring with it a standard uh, that is required, and and our introduction of a zero deforestation policy in Brazil is a is a great example of trying to change mindset and and um, approach and practice. And if that gains momentum and you have other institutional investors who have the same view that, that the incentive for farmers or for landowners to deforest, if they take the view that part of their exit route no longer exists because buyers will look at that, um, I, I think it's an important game changer. So that policy is, is designed around the round table for responsible soybean mm. um, production. So what we're looking at is if we do invest in properties in Brazil, the properties are certifiable. As part of that process of putting this policy in place, we went ra- back retrospectively and, and looked at all the properties that we acquired historically in, in Brazil and made sure that they were certifiable for round table for responsible soybean production as well. So I think institutions are critical um, in the sector to change thinking and, and to change practice. And, and saying that institutional investment is a bad thing is just a, a misconception that people have. It's actually a good thing for the sector. The World Bank say agriculture needs $80 billion of outside capital on an annual basis. Institutional capital can fit into that role very well. Yeah. And I really want to dive into this piece about public perception of institutional capital and agriculture. But before we do, what is the deforestation standard in Brazil? How are you quantifying that? Is Are you just not investing into lands that are kind of on the perimeter bordering areas that would be considered forest? Or how does that actually break down? The round table of responsible so- soybean, the validation is carried out by uh, independently by uh, control union. So they do the validation for the certification for the standard. So any individual property, there are various layers that they look at as they start looking at areas of preservation, areas of scientific value. um, And then they also look at the timing at which the Sahara was cleared. And then one of the measures which they can look at is the biomass density per hectare. So uh, from memory, I think it's 88 tonnes per hectare of biomass. Um, if the level of biomass is above that, it falls into a category where um, it can't, it, it couldn't, if it has been cleared, it's not certifiable. And, and this, is a, this is an example where data and technology comes into play. All of this is possible because you can get satellite imagery and a, a, analyze what the change has been to the, the cropping area over time by looking at those historic satellite images. Um, and so there's a very, very robust and rigorous approach on how, how the standard is certified. Now, I think what we need to get into context is today, less than, I think it's 2% of globally traded soybean carries the roundtable for responsible soybean certification. So it is a relatively small volume, but consumer pressure means that that will increase. So we firmly believe that putting in place these sort of standards and these initiatives are, are really important to change mindset and thinking in, in the agricultural sector. I just want to play devil's advocate for a second. If you're investing in land that has not been deforested or clear cut over the last some odd years, doesn't that just mean that someone else will own that land? So like, are we creating any additional value right now? Or is it is, is the goal to, to set up a system to be able to realize that in the future? Ultimately, the marketplace is what drives change, and it's quite conceivable that we will reach a point in time, some somewhere in the future, where there'll be a two-tier market. There will be a market for soybeans which are certified, and there will be a market for soybeans which are not certifiable for roundtable for responsible soy production. Now, in in that event, if you don't have certification, you're penalised from an economic point of view. So. What we're doing doesn't change the world, but if you don't have organizations, so RTRS ultimately was put together by a group collaborating to try and improve practice. So if you've got consumer pull and you've got the trade, um, so the Cargill's, Bungies, Kofco's of this world also doing things to procure soybeans which are certified, 
this is what changes things over time. So I think multiple efforts need to take place to, to drive change. Um, and what we're doing is just one, one example of that. But yeah. it's a very, very complex topic, isn't it? Because if we look agriculturally, yeah. globally, many, many areas which we consider to be cropping areas and we, we think they've been cropped, in eternity, that's not the case. So what's the climax of vegetation in, in the Midwest? What's the climax of vegetation in the Black Earth region of Ukraine and Russia? It was steppe, uh, grassland and pasture, which is why you've got soils with very high organic matter because you had pasture sequestrating carbon over hundreds of years. So land use change, most land has had a change of use at some point in time. Yeah. Um, it's just a case of when it was changed and where we where we arrive at. Uh, we, we can't necessarily reverse what happened historically. There are certain things that we can do. We can plant up areas which are uneconomic and we can look to improve efficiency through doing things like that. But we can't plant trees across the whole of Western Australia. And Western Australia, if you go back <laughs> a, a couple of hundred years, did have significant tree cover. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? We can we can grow crops in such a way. Uh, we can have no tillage. We can grow cover crops. We can grow companion crops. We can try and integrate livestock into the the arable cycle. I think there's challenges associated with that because of the specialisation in in agriculture these days. But we can do multiple things which can make a significant difference. So. Uh, it's all about changing the thinking and the mindset over time. But the, the best way to do that is uh, through uh, the capital markets and, and people being rewarded for what value they can bring in natural capital terms. Yeah, very well said. I want to go back now to the discussion about public perception of institutional capital. So some adversaries of institutional ownership of ag lands might say that institutional capital is a bad thing for agriculture. And it's not hard to imagine a situation where a purely financially motivated investor pursues short-term gains at the detriment of soil, environment, and climate, to name a few. But one can just as easily imagine a situation where an institutional investor is able to take a longer-term view, perhaps at the detriment of short-term returns, and really build and improve the land with the goal of potentially selling it at a higher value in the future. So how would you feel this concern or this skepticism that institutional capital is a bad thing for agriculture? Well, if you think about what drives the value of land, so an intrinsic part of the value is the soil, the quality of soil, and the asset that, that you have. So really, there's no, no logical reasoning to deplete or erode or damage that intrinsic value over time. So I commented earlier that we're custodians of the the assets that we're investing in and we should leave them in a, in a better condition. Um, leaving them in a better condition is entirely logical because they'll have a greater value um, if, if that's the case. So any institutional investor has a vested interest to invest in the land. We're not interested in short-termism. If you think about our clients, our investors, what are they looking for? They're looking for quality assets which are not correlated to the economic cycle, which can generate stable cash flows in the long term, long dated assets. So investing in the long term for the future and to, to enhance that capital value is really what it's all about. So I wouldn't agree with some of the comments that are made about what institutions do. Now, okay, I think people take an approach where and I would call this a, an irresponsible approach where they just put all the land out to tender on an annual basis, so auction for lease or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, okay, you could you could argue the case that somebody comes along, leases the land, they don't really care about the long term. So if I think about um, assets that we have and, and the term of lease agreement, uh, we do think in the long term, um, that does vary by market, but lease agreements that we have in Australia and Poland and Brazil are five to ten years. The precedent in the US is for much shorter lease terms, and really that's because farmers prefer to, to be in a shorter lease term, which they, they believe gives them more optionality around negotiating rent levels. 
But if I look at the portfolios that we have in the US, we have a very, very low turnover of tenants. And that's because it's a, a partnership. So I said earlier that we think of our tenants as, as a client. So we want to be in relationships with people in the long term. Um, there's trust built around those relationships. Uh, and if I look at the turnover of tenants, that really is reflected in that. Those good tenants who we work with in, in the long term, their view on what they're doing, the fact that they're looking after the assets in the long term aligns with ours. So uh, it, it's a partnership which makes complete sense. Yeah. And so you guys have a fairly hands-on approach with a lot of the folks that you're leasing out to. Like, you're, I guess, how does that oversight level play in? And when does this statement actually hold true that an institutional investor might be more extractive or depletive of the land because of the way that the incentives are set up with the lease structure? It's entirely reasonable to say that if you don't try and have a relationship with your tenants, you don't interface with them, you're not necessarily going to have relationships which are going to stand the test of time. So uh, I made a comment earlier, Borna, that our business is based around having people on the ground in the locations where we invest. Yeah. Those people have very deep relationships with the farming community, with the tenants, and, and that alignment that I talked about um, really is what it's all about. So that's, that's a differentiator for our business. Now, that's not to say that we don't take advantage of, of using technology and we can look at things remotely, but that on-the-ground relationship, people that respect each other, relationships that have been built over time is, is critical to, to what we do. And across the whole business, that is true wherever, whichever location that, that you look at. Now, if uh, one of the concerns that certainly exists from my point of view is, is institutional investors think they can invest without having a local presence mm -hmm. because technology means that they can do that. Um, I think it's a, it's a sector that's very difficult to be able to do that. And, and, and I would caution any investor who thinks that they can look at it in that way. You have to have local presence because 85% of agriculture globally is in private businesses and many of those businesses are, are family-owned generations that have been operating assets. Not to say that there's not corporate agriculture, but family, small, private businesses predominate. And just because they're family operations, I think there's a misconception that exists there. Some of the family businesses that we work with and have worked with over a long time are as sophisticated as any of the large corporations or listed companies that, that, that you could look, look at and they also have incredibly good alignments in what they're doing because they own, they own the business so they have a vested um, interest to make it work. Now within institutional ownership there's the subset of foreign ownership and clearly a lot of people are concerned about this in the US. I think six states ban foreign ownership of farmland and three or more are kind of on their way there. What are people afraid of here and is this an illogical reaction from the public? Yeah, so Paul, you've done your research. There's, there's states in the US that have got that don't allow foreign ownership and there's also states that don't allow corporate ownership. And a great example of a state which is a, uh, in the Midwest is an agricultural powerhouse is Iowa, which doesn't allow foreign or corporate ownership. What are people concerned about? And, and let's be clear here, it's not just the US uh, where there's concern about ownership of farmland. There are other locations globally where the same thing exists. Um, Australia has the Foreign Investment Review Board, which look at all agricultural or farmland acquisitions. New Zealand has the Overseas Investment Office. Argentina has a restriction on foreign ownership. So there are other locations as well. Why does this exist? Because... It's an emotive topic. Where does our food come? It comes from farmland. Who owns our farmland? Now, some of the concerns probably been driven by some of the land grabbing that you could say has gone on, and that's land grabbing that's been driven by food security-related issues. So mm -hmm. if we look at Australia and New Zealand, there's been significant investment out of China there, and, and you could argue that that's driven from a food security point of view. So ultimately... What drives the legislature to put in place measures to control ownership is the fact that it's an emotive topic. Where does my food come from? Who owns the land that produces my food? Uh, if we think about commercial real estate in contrast, 
who really cares about who owns an office building or a shopping mall or a hotel. Nobody really cares because it's just not that same connectivity. Yeah. If you think about Iowa, agriculture is a very, very important sector in Iowa. But I think one of the thing, interesting things to look at is you look at Iowa and you look at Illinois and you look at um, size of business. And if you look at land values, there's very little difference. So in one state, you've got no corporate or foreign ownership, whereas Illinois has no restrictions. So to the people that say institutional investors, foreign investors are driving land values to unrealistic levels, if they did, they, in theory, would be a significant difference in value between farmland in Illinois and Iowa. That doesn't exist. Business sizes are very similar. So that disproves the theory. So then if we look at the example you just gave, Illinois, as opposed to Iowa, are we seeing any sort of difference in how those markets are run? I would say that in, in Iowa, a lot of land is owned by private investors. So they might be originally from Iowa and they like to invest in some farmland. Um, from, a, from a return point of view, it makes sense to them. So I think the ownership Farm business structure is very similar. If you look at, look at Illinois, the majority of, of, of the entrepreneurial farming businesses, they own a core of land and, and invariably that's land that the family settled. Mm -hmm. They bought more land to complement that, but they also lease in land. And I can think of tenants we have who lease off multiple land owner, landowners, they lease off institutional owners, they lease off private owners. So I don't think the structure of business businesses is, is, is different, but in Iowa, you probably have more private investment in, in farmland. It could be local people investing in farmland. It could be people from away investing in farmland, but it's private, non-corporate, and, and they're not foreign. So, of course, from a, we've been talking a great deal about institutional investment in the sector. If you look at real assets generally, retail investors have not invested in real assets generally to any extent and particularly in, in, in farmland. So we have a couple of REITs in the US where private investors can invest, but generally speaking, it's not a sector which really has seen a great deal of activity with retail capital. Yeah, that makes sense. One last question here is, is COVID making people want to reclaim their own land for food security purposes? Like, are there are there countries or regions of the world where we are seeing food security issues that are now thinking, OK, I no longer want this foreign entity to be owning this land. I need that land to be producing what I need for my people. I think it's heightened. Uh, if, if you look at the, the range of things that the, the pandemic has brought about it has heightened awareness um, about nationalism it has heightened awareness about food security so through the pandemic we had governments um, looking at strategic reserves of food so a number of southeast southeast asian countries put limitations on rice exports so there's no doubt it has increased the focus but i think when people actually think about what producing their own food involves i think Many people um, probably have looked at gardening and, and this year, because they've been at home so much, if they do have a garden, they've contemplated growing some vegetables um, or doing some gardening. And indeed, certainly in Europe, seed sales for garden plants, vegetables increased significantly through the pandemic. But I think we many things can change subtly, but we're not going to do a wholesale reverse on how supply chains have evolved and how uh, the market has evolved. One thing that's been very clear from the pandemic is that some of the convoluted supply chains that we have are very vulnerable to disruption. Um, so technology has a role to play at every level and adoption of technology in the agricultural sector undoubtedly has been accelerated as a result of the pandemic. But if we think about blockchain, and the ability technologies like blockchain offer to have e-commerce platforms where you can connect the consumer closer to the producer, I think rather than there be a wholesale move to repatriating land and, and people taking possession of the land that they 
uh, own in, in history. We're going to see people more concerned about provenance and wanting to be closer connected to the producer and what we have available to us in digitization of the sector means that that is possible. Disruption-wise, middle men, as you might call them, in the sector, I think, are going to be squeezed as the consumer and the producer or the processor and the producer are brought closer together by shorter supply chains with unparalleled traceability, uh, which can be brought about by blockchain, amongst other technologies. Yeah, well, I mean, it's great to hear that the largest farmland investor is kind of thinking about a lot of this stuff on these progressive lines, sustainability, transparency, innovation. So that's certainly very heartening. How can people support your work? Just just continue being teachers and contributing to their uh, their pension funds? Or is there another way people can support your, your a lot of your guys' work? Yeah, so our focus is on institutional capital. So we invest capital for the TIA general account and we invest capital for other investors as well. Uh, I certainly think one of the things that we're going to see with the recognition of farmland being a very good asset class which provides stable returns over time, we are going to see increased focus from retail investors, private investors. There are one or two vehicles which have been mooted which will be publicly listed vehicles and I'm sure we will see that. So the sector needs external capital, uh, whether that comes from institutions, whether it comes from retail investors, that capital is needed to invest in technology, to invest in the supply chain, pathway to market, to invest in increased efficiency, and that's required to deliver this double in production that we need over the next 50 years, but that doubling in production takes place in an environment where the availability of land decreases on a daily basis, but also where we have to be extremely measured in resource use and we need to be very reflective on the impact of what we do in agriculture on on climate and, and the change in climate. Yeah. Well, Martin, this has been an extremely insightful episode and I I learned a ton. I think this was a very unique episode. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Pleasure, Borna. Enjoy it very much. And thank you very much. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you liked the episode, please rate us and give us a review on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, or Google Play. And if you really like the episode or if you just want to help push forward the climate resilience movement, share the episode with friends and family. If you have any feedback or you'd like to add your own two cents on the topic discussed today, feel free to shoot me an email at media at climate.ai. I do respond to all emails. At its core, this podcast is a way for us to learn and to share our learnings as we go. So we're always open to building on these conversations and hearing more perspectives. Thanks for your support and see you next time.